Well, let's open with a word of prayer and we'll jump right in. Welcome to all who may be following us on, on the internet. Um, you are welcome and we're glad you're with us. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that we can come together as your people and we can deal with the difficult words that Paul offers us in the book of 1 Corinthians. Help us as we move through this to hear in new ways and open our hearts to your will for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're at 1 Corinthians 5, and we're going to take 5 and 6 together. So if one person would like to read 5, and then someone else can pick it up at 6, that would be great. Ladies, before we jump. Oh, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you and of a kind that is not found even among pagans. For a man is living with his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus on the man who has done such a thing. When you are assembled and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are delivered. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really um, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our paschal lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral men, not at all, meaning the immoral of this world or the greedy and robbers and idolaters, since then, you would need to go out of the world. But rather, I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of immorality or greed or is an idolater, reveler, drunk, drunkard, or robber, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Drive out the wicked person from among you. Somebody want to pick up six? Oh, I'll pick it up. When any of you has a grievance against another, do you dare to take it to court before the unrighteous instead of taking it before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels to say nothing of ordinary matters? If you have ordinary cases, then do you appoint as judges those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to decide between one believer and another, but a believer goes to court against a believer and before unbelievers at that? In fact, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? but you yourselves wrong and defraud and believers at that. Do you know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers, None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you used to be, but you were washed, you were sanctified, 
you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body. But the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, I glorify God. In your body. Right. As Jackie was saying before we started, we are getting into some, to some deep material now. <laughs> so what do you hear in all this? What questions do you have? What well he sure is hard on the sinner. You yep. know, and cast him out. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, for today's church, aren't we supposed to say, you know, help bring sinners together? And and how are we supposed to be the judge? Yeah, well, even they, the Pope said, who am I to judge? Well, it said, uh, it looked like a contradiction for a little bit here. For a chat, a verse 12 in chapter 5, for what, what have I to do with judging those outside? Is it not those who are inside that you are so are to judge? God will judge those outside. Drive out the wicked person from among you. And then the first verse in chapter six or two. When any of you has a grievance against another, do you dare to take it to court before the unrighteous instead of taking it before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Isn't that the outside? Well, yeah, that he's uh, the indication, is, I think, is, <clears throat> and you will find in other places at Paul, that when the end of time comes, those who are the saints, oh. those who are the of the church, oh, will be the judges. Those who've of, gone before us. And been well, saints. all of the Christians will, you know, all oh, those all who are in God will be, will stand as witnesses before um, God to the sins of the world. So there's kind of this concept that runs in early Christianity that ultimately those who will um, carry out, out the judgment on behalf of God are the, is the church. Uh, I knew there was an answer to it. But <laughs> I, there is to everything in here. So yeah. I guess we have to, you know, part of it is you have to kind of, Paul is always hard because his arguments are kind of like puzzles that you have to kind of put one piece in place before you can move on to the next. So what's the sexual behavior that Paul holds up as being something that you have to treat relatively seriously here? As we Incest. Yeah, that some son <coughs> somewhere in the congregation is sleeping with his father's wife. So is it's it his mother? mother? <laughs> there you it, go. They end it down <laughs> It's in these mother. notes somewhere, I don't remember where I read it. They refer to that as a stepson. Yeah. Okay. It can be, you know, in some ways it's not real clear. I don't think the Greek carries the idea of whether a son is a stepson or a natural right. son. Um, but somehow we know some son somewhere <laughs> yeah. is sleeping with his father's wife. So that's, you know, 
So why is that particular thing so outrageous, according to Paul? Well, it just ruins the entire family structure. Okay. But, There's an undermining of the family structure that goes with this. But that's not, that's a sin. They, he calls it like it's the sin of the body. Yep. And, and he'll get to that later, that somehow our actions in the body are tied to our spiritual reality. Right. So what you're doing with your body <laughs> is an extension of what goes on with your spirituality. Yes. But early on, Paul says why this is so bad. He says, um, let's see. And of a kind that is not found even among pagans. Yeah. So even people outside the church <laughs> know that this is bad. You know, um, it's not like we as Christians have some different reality from the rest of the world. But even those outside of us know this is bad, which means that those outside the church will what? Not be saved? Probably not because they look at the church and they say, you mean the church lets that go on? <laughs> oh, I Why would we possibly want to be involved then with people who allow that? We, but, even we don't believe that's a good idea. But the church isn't necessarily necessarily allowing it. Yeah. Well, if Paul's saying if the church doesn't respond to this in some forceful way, then people are going to relate the behavior that's going on to the church itself. Because that person now is claimed by the church as a member of the church family. So if this is going on that way, then what's happening is that, you know, people are going to say, well, the church must think this is okay if they're allowing it to happen. You know, if they're not saying to someone who is a member of their community, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be doing that. Then you're throwing yourself um, into the same category in some ways. And so Paul has a lot of, you know, whether we, this is one of the places where Paul is both, I know, I'm, I understand what Paul's saying, and I, and I appreciate Paul's position on this, and Paul is absolutely right in one sense. But there's another side of me that says, yeah, but I don't care what the, <laughs> because in other ways, things I do as a Christian are counter to worldly realities as well, you know, that I, um, you know, sometimes have preach the word of peace when in the world other people are saying, no, we need to be at war or whatever. That's counter to what the world's about. And there are people who may not. But what Paul is saying is people will be rejecting Christ and rejecting the church, not because of something that Christ commands or that Christ calls us to, but for something that's actually counter to what Christ is all about, which is about... Um, faithfulness in marriage, about faithfulness in our relationships. And Paul will get into that more deeply as you get into chapters 7, 8, 9. Paul will start to talk more about the importance of our, um, our faithful commitment to each other. And so Paul says, well, you know, the world's watching. And what do they see? They see us just kind of ignoring this and not really doing it. I, I read this in the context, or I read it, in the context of our welcome statement. Mm -hmm. And I came across this, drive out the wicked person from you. Mm -hmm. We'll take fornicators, <laughs> we'll take idolaters, <laughs> we'll take, you know, those who've been in prison, uh, we'll we'll take risks with people. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we would put that in our welcome statement. <laughs> But we would welcome anybody that walked in that right. door. <clears throat> though there are behaviors that though we as a welcoming community say we welcome all into our midst, yeah. and we do with people with various identities and stuff, there are behaviors that are damaging mm -hmm. to the community and damaging um, even to the life of individuals who participate in them that we as the church would say, 
that's just wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, yeah. we may still love you as a child of God. We may still, but this behavior is not acceptable. You know, and um, we call you to account for that behavior. I mean, there are, pe- and rightfully so, we had a whole long struggle with this reality back in the 70s and 80s that there were pastors who were, you know, having affairs with people in their congregations. And the church had to step forward and say to those people, I'm sorry, you can no longer be a pastor in this church. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is not acceptable behavior. That is not, you know, and not because of questions of identity or whatever. This is a question of unfaithfulness to vows and relationships that we have, because ultimately Christianity, one of the hearts of, of Christian ethical understanding is that we live in faithfulness in our relationships. We don't necessarily, you know, one of the things we probably moved more into now is we broaden the definition of what those relationships may be in some ways. So we talk about now um, people in the LBGTQIA having relationships, faithful relationships that we look at and we say, well, that that is part of the reality that God has created us to be. And we we within the ELCA have kind of made that statement about our reality. But we still hold up that in those relationships, <laughs> there still has to be faithfulness. There still has to be accountability to each other. There still has to be a concern for one another that marks those relationships. And so here, the you know, what we have is someone who has no concern for those relationships at all. You know, you really have to be <laughs> well, that's in here too. You need to th- judge those who are inside. Right. Inside the community. We ha- you know, again, part of our honesty with each other as Christians is when there is something that needs to be called into, into account, we have to be able to step forward and say, well, as a community, we recognize that this kind of behavior mm. is wrong. Well, I have something to say. Okay. <laughs> and that is more uh, today. It, Paul talks about the the son who's with his mother. Mm. But how about the father who's with his daughter? That would be equally that would be appalling. Yeah, that would be equally appalling in Paul's mindset. Yeah. Obviously, here, there's a specific case that everybody in the congregation knows about. And for whatever reason, people... I mean, I suppose that's often true in churches, I, uh, that there's something going on in the church that's wrong, but nobody wants to have the laundry displayed before the world. And so we quietly deal with it and we don't, you know, really um, engage it as forcefully as we should. And that's what Paul is saying here. You've got to, you can't just... <laughs> pretend like this isn't happening you can't just you know somehow now we can certainly ask a question about what do we think about his judgment on this i mean that's that's another aspect of what's going on with within this is that paul then says um and you should give this person over to satan <laughs> because you know that that's the only well, well, first of all, what do you think about that kind of statement from Paul? Well, this person should just be given over to sin. Well, that's pure Paul. <laughs> I mean, he's very, he's he, he really is very direct. Mm-hmm. And so this doesn't surprise me. Okay. And However, what does Paul mean when he, he talks about <clears throat> giving someone over to sin? What's that? So he should go to hell? <laughs> Uh, no, well, maybe it's his way of saying it. Um, Excommunicated? That's probably yeah. closer to what Paul's talking about. Yeah. What he's talking about is this person <coughs> should be placed out into the world um, and face the realities that are out in the world. Because Paul will also talk about in other places within his letters that um, Satan is the one who really is 
in charge in the world, that the world is really under the control of the evil one. So this person should be placed back out there, but for what purpose? An example? No, so they'll come back. So they'll come back. Okay. So the point is, this person should be subjected to the rigors of punishment of whatever is out there in the world. Um, even the threat of eternal damnation so that they can understand the severity of what's going on and turn around. It's kind of like in the, if you go back to the prophets, the prophets aren't saying, well, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed and all this stuff because they want to see that happen. <laughs> but they hope by proclaiming that and people coming to understand it, that they will turn around from the behavior that they're in and enter into relationship with God again. So the point is not, you know, we want this person then just to be destroyed for eternity. The point is we we release them into the into the struggles that go with living um, in the movements of the world, so that maybe they will return and be a part of. Be born again. <laughs> well, you know, the pendulum never stops in the middle. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So we, the religions look at this, get rid of them. Well, then pretty soon, well, that person is parting their hair on the left side instead of the get rid of them, mm -hmm. you know, and it got. Drive out the wicked person. So yeah, but who's, who's, I mean, yeah, but then they go nuts. And then the the rules start, and 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 yeah. it's, it's it, and Paul will get to that in a little bit. How do you then deal with that once you start down that road of passing judging. judgment? Yeah, how do you prevent yourself and the church from moving radically down that road and then condemning everybody? Yeah, you know? doesn't it become a church of man instead of a church of God? Yeah. In a way, or man-made, man-made rules. Well, yeah. the problem is, you know, and I think Paula is alluding to it here. And as we, uns you know, kind of unspool this whole argument through the next few chapters, what Paul will talk about is that we within the church, we who live in the world, are caught between a tension of at one end, and he talks about it here. What does he mean when he says, you know, this this section is an interesting section in six through eight, he says, uh, do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch as you really are unleavened. For our Paschal lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast is of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So what's Paul saying there? It's basically saying what you were just saying to us, that uh, the idea is just to bring them back and bring them back uh, as a part of the community that lives well that's what he'll else. say later but first of all he's saying what happened what does leaven do it raises the it raises loaf. the whole loaf so you put a little leaven in and it makes the loaf now if you put in bad leaven the whole loaf the whole bad. loaf gets bad mm -hmm. and so paul's saying you know if you just ignore this behavior then what will happen is that this person and the behaviors they're part of are going to begin to shape the entire community. This is, you know, Paul is not somehow saying here that we need to do this because this person is just awful. And we hope that God will just leave them out of everything in the future, but that their place in the community endangers the entire community. And that those are the places where Paul becomes particular. You know, if you read all of Paul's letters as a corpus rather than just one, Paul's main the places where Paul comes to this sort of 
judgment is always when the community is in danger. And Paul says, you know, you, it, you can't allow one person to destroy the nature of the community. And so at that point, you have to then intervene for the sake of the community. Now, we might not like how he, he makes that sort of distinction, um, but he's talking about that kind of reality, something that at its heart will destroy the entire nature of the community. Um, It just occurs to me, and I think I said this one other day when we were here, that uh, they they were just starting. I mean, they were uh, a new reality mm -hmm. in that ancient world. Mm -hmm. And probably every member was really precious. They needed to stick together. Mm -hmm. And they needed to learn what it is that we really need to expect of people, ask of people, mm -hmm. hope for, and what is so important that we can't let it happen in our community. Mm -hmm. Because we can't go on like the world around us is going on. Mm -hmm. So they're way back here and we're over here and have what a couple thousand years. Well, yeah, and in some ways the this. extremes. So of our community are very different than the extremes of Paul's. Yes. Community. Um, so Paul has a real concern that what binds a community together is its ability to live in trust and faithfulness with one another. And if you don't hold that standard for the community, then what will glue the community together? It will come apart at the seams at that point. And so Paul says, you know, you can't. This is just such a blatant <laughs> sort of stepping outside of that bond of faithfulness we're called to as the people of God. We are called to be faithful as God is faithful. This is so far outside of that that even people outside the church know that it's wrong. Then how can we continue to allow this to continue within our boundaries? because it will erode away the very center of who we are. That's his analysis of this reality. And so he says, we've got to, we've got to excise that or the community is in danger of coming apart. Um, and then he goes on to talk about that, you know, within ourselves even, that's the reality we live in. So he kind of goes into, but if we moved into, well, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and we live within the realities of this day right. that they never heard of. Right. Never. We know 20 or what, 20 centuries more uh, reality. Right. And we're always learning more. So it's always. Right. But even in our day, wouldn't we say this kind of behavior is not? So, oh, it's yeah, that doesn't mean that none of this yeah. is, yeah. But so then he'll go into you know, as kind of an extension of this. And remember, part of the problem is this inside outside sort of reality. Mm -hmm. That's why he talks about, you know, who am I to judge people on the outside? I'm not people I judge as people who are on the inside with me because we have kind of as a community made our own, have our own understanding of what the vision God wants for us is. So within our community, yes, we then exercise this kind of, mm -hmm. of need. Yeah. And then, so then he goes on, and that's why it's so important that when you have disagreements within the community, and remember, um, Corinth is filled at this point with disagreements, with party spirit and people not in accord with one another. Yeah. And it, it's a struggling community in that sense. So he says, well, then what you're going to what, what you guys keep doing is you go out to the courts and you say, OK, we can't figure this out in our community, which is supposed to be a community of love and care and respect and all these things. Instead, you go out to the courts outside of the community. <laughs> You take these things out there because you can't figure out how to do it in here. 
But the problem is then the world sees that and says, well, the Christians can't even figure out their own household. They have to come to us <laughs> to get it figured out. Um, and so Paul says that, you know, that why does, so why can't you handle yourselves, if you are a loving, respecting community, the disagreements that you have? If you don't, it's going to, again, Paul's concerned about the tearing apart of the community. And so he says, you know, if I, I would rather just have somebody defraud me <laughs> than tear things apart over it. I'd rather just, you know, have it all kind of just happen rather than that. So, um, so that's what he's trying to get at when he says, you guys are the ones who have to handle the internal function of your community together, to do that with love and respect. Um, there even need need to judge angels, it says. I assume they're the same thing as saints. Yeah, well, again, this is the, Paul there again is looking to the end times when mm -hmm. supposedly the saints of God are the ones who sit in the judgment seats at the end of time. And he says, at that time, even angels okay. are under your sway as judges in the end time. So if you're going to be doing something that grandiose when we get to the end of time, can't you even handle the simple matters today? <laughs> like who owes who what? Um, how do you stop a fight between two people who are, you know, threatening to tear the church apart over their little feud that they're having over whatever? And we've all seen that in churches where this member gets all uptight about this and has this kind of little beef with this member over there. And then they each start to draw in their own army of people who supports them against the other person. And pretty soon you have this divided community. <laughs> yep. That's trying, you know, can't live together because, you know, they have no sense of that. So Paul says, um, you have to, <laughs> pull this together mm -hmm. you've got to work this out um, and then he returns to you know the idea that the community has to be a place not a perfection because people aren't perfect you know it's as simple right. as that we're just not Paul nowhere in here says you have to be a perfect sort of soul but he does say you have to realize that what you do physically what you do in the world is related to your spirituality. So if you're out there stealing from people, <laughs> what does that say about your relationship with God? Not very pure. <laughs> if you're out there with prostitutes, and I think that's a little bit tied to what we're going to get to in a little bit about, um, about, Marriage fidelity. If you're out there with prostitutes when you're married, what does that say about your understanding of faithful commitment to each other? You know, if you're greedy and only care about yourself, what does that say about your spiritual connection to God and the rest of the world? All these things are related to our spirituality. They're not separate areas because there are probably some people who that. If, we get impressions from other places where Paul talks, in fact, even in First Corinthians, some that there are some people who say, well, now that I'm saved, I can do whatever I want. That's what it means to be free in Christ, is that you can just do whatever. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> but Paul says, well, no, that's not what it means. If you are tied to Christ, if you're one with Christ, Paul says, and you go and visit a prostitute who the Old Testament says to enter into sexual relationships with someone is to be of one flesh, then aren't you bringing God into this relationship and somehow sullying what it means to be a Christian? You know, that's what Paul is asking them to consider. How are you in your existence showing forth your spirituality? 
They're not separate entities. Kind of like, you know, uh, occasionally, I'm glad I don't hear it as much anymore, but you'll say something to people and it's, they'll say, well, when I'm in church, <laughs> but when I'm outside church, then <laughs> life, you know, um, uh, you know, there was some person who I, I forget who the quote was from. They said, uh, we sow our wild oats six days a week. And on the seventh, we pray for a crop failure. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like <laughs> what sometimes happens with us. You know, we just do whatever the rest of the week. And then we come into the church and we say, oh, God, I'm sorry. And then we go out and do the same <laughs> over again. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yes. then Paul says, what kind of spirituality is that at that point? You know, are you really in? Um, I notice in this one, it's the whole letters about problems in the church. Mm -hmm. Evidently, it's kind of the, the direction of most of it. Um, but also food is meant for the stomach, it says, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. Mm. What, what is that about? When we think about food, if it's related to the body, we want to take in the best food right. that guarantees our health mm -hmm. and uh, it sets a good role model for our this kids, is, I suppose. Is it, yeah. if the Jews got in here a little bit? With their uh, eating and well, actually, Paul will. This is a I know it's kind of a, a road yeah a uh, on food. It, yeah, it's kind of a look yeah. forward to what Paul is going to say. But ultimately, what Paul will argue in the next few chapters is that ultimately, what defines who we are as Christians is our relationship with God. Everything else is going to pass away. Your social status is going to pass away. Your, um, oh. you know, those who are saying that I'm holier because I observe a certain diet or whatever, um, that's all going to pass away. Ultimately, when you get to the end, <laughs> what matters is what God does in establishing us as the people of God. So that's, you know, that's the ultimate reality. And what Paul is saying here, kind of as he moves into that, is that um, what we do with our bodies, with our actions, with everything that we have, either brings glory to God or defames God. So what are you going to do? What's going to be your priorities as you move forward? as the people of God. So let's move into chapter seven and he'll start to kind of unpack all of this. Somebody want to read chat? Oh, I'll read. <laughs> I got about five minutes. I got to go. Okay. Now concerning the matter about which you wrote, it is well for a man not to touch a woman. That's what some people are saying. That's not what Paul is necessarily saying, but that's what some people are saying. But because of cases of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a set time, to devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Thus, I say by way of concession, not command, not telling you you have to do this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has a particular gift from God, one having one kind, another a different kind. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is well for them to remain unmarried as I am. But if they're not practicing self-control, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to be aflame with passion. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does separate, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say, I, and not the Lord, that if any believer has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. And if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, 
and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy through her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such a case, the brother or sister is not bound. It is to peace that God has called you. Wife, for all you know, you might save your husband. Husband, for all you know, you might save your wife. However, that may be. Let each of you lead the life that the Lord has assigned to you, which God called you. This is my rule in all the church. Was anyone at the time of of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But obeying the commandment of God is everything. Let each of you remain in the condition in which you were called. Were you a slave when called? Do not be concerned about it. Even if you can gain your freedom, make use of your present condition now more than ever. For whoever was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed person belonging to the Lord, just as whoever was free when called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of human masters. In whatever condition you were called, brothers and sisters, there remain with God. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the impending crisis, it is well for you to remain as you are. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you do not sin. And if a virgin marries, she does not sin. Yet those who marry will experience distress in this life. And I would spare you that. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as they, though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about the affairs of the world, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried woman and the virgin are anxious about the affairs of the Lord, so that they may be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about the affairs of the world, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to put any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and unhindered devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his fiance, if his passions are strong, and so it has to be, let him marry as he wishes. It is no sin. Let them marry. But if someone stands firm in his resolve, being under no necessity, but having his own desire under control, and has determined in his own mind to keep her as his fiance, he will do well. So when he who marries his fiance does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do better. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if the husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, only in the Lord. But in my judgment, she is more blessed if she remains as she is. And I think that I, too, have the spirit of God. So, (laughs) what does all that mean? (laughs) Keeping your vows. Okay, again, there's this idea that we are a community of faithfulness. And that our sexual behavior is grounded in faithfulness. So that, you know, if um, when we enter into sexuality, there is an expectation that it's within the bounds of a committed relationship to one another. And that, in fact, is the standard we within the ELCA now hold as really, when we talk about sexuality, that's the central concept, that sexuality is most life-giving, is most um, as God intends when those relationships are done in in a committed mutual relationship, that people aren't meant to be um, just resources we use for our gratification. (laughs) that this is an extension of our commitment to one another. So certainly that's a big 
chunk of what Paul is um, is talking about. But Paul is also frustrated that people are holding him up as an example for their argument that people should avoid sex altogether. Look, Paul doesn't have a wife. Look, Paul has kind of had this celibate, celibate sort of life. So everybody should be like that. Yeah. <laughs> Including people who are married. Some of the people are arguing in Corinth. And Paul says, no. <laughs> it, it, that's not the way Paul argues that this, if you do that, if you're married and you say, no, you should never have sex with one another. All you're doing is setting people up for temptation and for disaster, <laughs> that that's just silly. Um, and Paul, one of the things that's kind of neat here is that Paul sees this as an equal sort of thing between men and women. He over and over says, mm -hmm. you both <laughs> have a responsibility to each other. That's what this relationship is about. There's a mutuality um, in this. Um, so Paul says, you know, it's not, don't use me as an example. You know, I have, this is my special calling. I do this because this is a way for me to be faithful in my relationship with God. And he kind of points out why for him it's important because, you know, if you're not married, then you don't have to worry about your family. You can throw yourself totally into whatever you have to be doing for the sake of the Lord. And that's the choice I make. But for some people, he goes on to say, that's just, it won't work. Not for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> you might have desires that are eating you up inside and you can't <coughs> then live this existence. If that's true, then go and get married. <laughs> and and you know, have the sexuality that goes with a part of it as a part of that. Um and then he also talks about the importance of realizing that that. Commitment has to be honored. You can't go out and get a divorce just because you're unhappy with, you know, whatever goes on with in, in your reality. Um, now, we, we hear these words kind of harder because <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's a part of the reality we live in as people of God. That's, um, and we have to be able to deal with that. Uh, in compassionate and caring ways. And in a little bit, we'll, we'll see that Paul talks about other issues along that reality, as that kind of understanding of reality, that it's not about somehow just exercising rules, but about in love approaching people and hearing the needs that they have and dealing with that. And I think that that's ultimately what it's about. But Paul is, again, establishing within the Christian community what the vision of reality is and the vision of reality is that when you make a commitment to someone that that commitment is to be honored um, in faithfulness um, I did want to read real quick one thing that puts this into context if I can find the page real quick it's the problem with hitting Kindle I can't always find things as quickly as you would like If you have anything else, go ahead. Well, I'm looking this up. <laughs> I'm going to embarrass you even further. We have nothing. <laughs> That's okay. I don't require people to have it. <laughs> what I see here in Paul is that the two people care about each other. Yeah. And uh, he, he doesn't, um, you know, really go into love. Mm -hmm. but you can see that there is a caring between them. So therefore stay together. Yep. You know? Well, and that you should <coughs> see this as, um, as part of your part of a relationship is that we, we are there for each other. We care for each other. Yeah. Um, and that, in that commitment, we work through difficulties. We don't just, now this is not what we've come to realize in the church is um, that that doesn't mean 
that um, no matter what happens, you stay together. There are right. points yeah. at which um, a relationship can become so unlife giving that um, it's broken. You know, and to stay in that relationship will damage the people who are a part of it. At that point, I think Paul would say, no, that's, you know, I'm not telling you, do that. (laughs) That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that ultimately we are a people of commitment and faithfulness. And our relationships are the places sometimes where those things get played out. And I am... um, holding that up for you as the people of God, as the ideal we live out of. So we don't just, Paul would say more, it's not just if you're sexually frustrated, then you just get a divorce and go find someone else. No, that's not. (laughs) Instead, you find a way to deal with that. Um, In the same way, or not in the same way, but along with that, this section has another difficulty when it talks about slavery, because a lot of people have just rejected Paul because they say, well, look, he's all for slavery. That's not what Paul is saying. He's not somehow saying, yes, we applaud slavery. I <laughs> think that's what we should do. What he is saying is that your status as a Christian is what marks your life. It's not whether you're a slave. It's not whether you're a free person. It's not whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. Wealthy or poor. Wealthy or poor, whatever. You are Christ's, no matter what your situation in life. So be careful about being becoming so concerned with changing your status that you lose your connection to Christ. Don't become obsessed with, okay, I'll get out of this slavery, and that's all that matters. And if I don't get free, then God must be lying, because it says, you know, Church says that we are free in Christ. Well, obviously I'm not. So (laughs) that must be, you know, instead realize that you are free wherever you happen to be to live as Christ's child. No matter what your situation in life. And that that identity overrides every other identity that we have as people. It makes us new wherever we're at. So if we're saying that Paul here is saying, well, slavery is a good thing, that's not what Paul is saying at all. Um, Paul recognizes that we as humans are constantly in this twin pool. We are the Lord's, and we know that, and we're in the world. (laughs) And it's you know, constantly this pull is going on. And Paul assures the Corinthians and us that in the midst of that pull, you are still Christ. Christ loves you, no matter what decisions we sometimes make. And the decisions we make are hard. They're not easy. There's no easy rules that tell us how to do this. How do we live as a Christian slave? (laughs) how do we live as a Christian wife or husband? What does that mean? There's not any like rule book that tells us we have to kind of work that out as we go. Um, And that we all eat all struggle with that pull. That's the reality we live in. And so Paul, that's why Paul says here so clearly that, you know, some of you who are divorced or some of you who are widowed, you may get married again. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Some of you who are widowed won't get married. Well, that's fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that either. Um, I thought he said, don't get married. He, he says said, that from know. his position, he finds that not being married frees him to do more for the Lord. So he recommends that. But he says, but if you're finding that you're struggling with your own sexual desires, the pulls that go on for intimacy, whatever, There's nothing wrong with getting married again. I'm not telling you don't do that. I'm telling you that there may be advantages for what you can do for the Lord if you're not married. (laughs) Um, So make the decision and know that God loves you whether you choose to get married again or not get married again. If you're you're, um, engaged to get married and you decide well, but God needs me to be more committed in what I do, so I'm going to postpone or even cancel the marriage. That's fine. 
you know. In fact, Paul would probably say that's a really good thing. But if you decide, well, I really need to follow through on this because either I'm struggling with my own desires or because of I, I love this person and my commitment to them is calling me to do this, then that's fine too. <laughs> You know, as long as you're living in faithfulness and love and what you're trying to do, there's no right answer, wrong answer. There's only the struggle we all live with the confidence that in Christ, we continue to be the children of God. I think that that's probably a pretty good place to leave it right now. Um, We're going to get into some more. (laughs) <laughs> the next section, eight and nine, is the section about meat sacrificed to idols, which is mm. <laughs> probably something we today are not like really panicked about. But in that day, it's incredibly important to figure out what they were going to do about that. Um, and then we will move on to some other actions that are going on in the church that bothered Paul. So read up through chapter 12. Next time we might or might not get that far, but okay, that will take you. Chapter twelve takes you into the arguments about spiritual gifts that are going on. Oh, I'm I can do this, so I'm better. (laughs) Yeah. If you were a real Christian, you'd be able to speak in tongues. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) If you were a real Christian, you'd be able to prophesy. Yeah. Um, And Paul says. "Eh." (laughs) <laughs> that's not how it works so okay. yeah right, well thank you thank mm-hmm. you once again yeah.